Well, today we're going to be uh, speaking about the will of God. That's something that people uh, uh, think about from time to time or struggle with. You know, is what I'm doing the right thing to be doing? And uh, I'm going to begin reading out of Psalm 32, 8. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Now, when you read that verse, Psalm 32, 8, there's no place in there that you find the phrase, the will of God. But even though the phrase is not there, it is certainly the idea of the verse. And it's its, it's, it's underlying theme. When we speak of God's will, we're actually speaking about you know, a couple of different things. We're speaking about what some people call the secret will of God, then his revealed will and his per- permissive will. And depending on how deep you want to get into that, there's a lot of other items that could be considered part of God's will. But for our discussion this morning, God's secret will is how he sovereignly rules over all things. This is the will of God that cannot be changed, it cannot be overcome, it cannot be defeated by anyone or anything in heaven or on earth. Job described it this way in chapter 42, verse 2. I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. I mean, Job really had a tough go there for a while in his life, but he still believed that God was on his throne and that someday he would understand everything that had happened. The secret will of God is is something that is beyond our comprehension. Uh, It's it's not been revealed yet. And sometimes I I call it hindsight theology. and, And by that I mean it's only perceived when we look back through history at the circumstances of our life. And then it's like a little light goes on and you, and you say, hey, I, I, I understand what God was doing then. It doesn't mean that everything that I experience, I experience as being joyful or that I want it to happen to me again. But when I look back through the lens of history, I can say, I see how God was at work. You know, there's been times in my life where I've stood in the pulpit, you know, and, and uh, I was dealing with a tragedy myself and And I would make the statement, and I I may make it again sometimes. Regardless of what has just happened in my life, I still believe God is on his throne. You know, God knew before Pat and Harold knew it that they wouldn't be here today. You know, and that's why I don't get too shook up about what happens on on Sunday morning because I still know that God is in control. Uh, maybe God had been trying to get Alan Jackson to church here for quite some time, so he, but he shows up and sings today, right? But uh, now, let me give you a contrast between God's secret will and his revealed will. In Deuteronomy 29 and verse number 9, it says, The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may follow all the words of his law. God's revealed will, if you want to know what God's will is, it's called the Bible. You pick up the Bible and you read it. You know, concerning the revealed will of God, we see it in the do's and the don'ts of the Bible. Thou shalt do this, thou shalt not do that. And, And the principles attached to those. Sometimes God tells us to do X, Y, and Z, but because we're human, we think we're smarter than God, and we think, well, God... I'm going to do A, B, C instead. And in a sense, that's the permissive will of God. God reveals his will to us, but we have a free will and we can choose to do something differently. Let me give you an example, and it's a very familiar story. God definitely instructed Adam and Eve, you can do eat from anything in the garden except the one tree. And don't eat from that tree. Do not eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. But you know what Adam and Eve did? They chose to do it anyhow. God said you can eat X, Y, Z, but they said we want to, we want to eat A, B, C. Now, in his permissive will, God permitted Adam and Eve to exercise their free will, and they chose to do evil instead of good And that is how sin entered the picture and corrupted all of God's creation. You see, God created Adam and Eve perfect, and in their free will that God gave them, God's perfect creation chose to do evil, and they sinned. Well, why have I chosen to speak on the will of God today? As I mentioned to some of you earlier, 
Uh, we were down in Texas uh, last weekend because our granddaughter Megan was graduating from Texas A&M. And uh, this is the time of year when people like her are trying to decide, where am I going to live? You know, how much do I want to pay for an apartment? She's already got a job, but there's many of them trying to figure out where they want to work. Uh, you know, we had graduation out here at Flint Hills. We had it in at El Dorado and Augusta and the surrounding schools, Blue Stem. And we've got these students that are trying to decide, do I really want to go on with my education? And it doesn't stop at sixth grade, by the way. Uh, <laughs> do, I, do I really want to go on from 12th grade on into a VOTEC? Do I want to go to two years at Butler? Or do I want to enroll in a four-year college? Or do I even want to go at all? Do I want to go directly into the workforce? And in a sense, they're trying to discover God's will for their life. It's a time where we're trying to connect the dots so that we can make the right decision. And I use that phrase because it, it reminds me of something that F.B. Meyer uh, discovered one time. Meyer was a highly respected preacher and British theologian. And he was on a ship one time, and they were, it was a kind of a foggy night, and he was wondering how they were going to get the boat into the dock. So he walked up to the captain and he said, Captain, how do you know when to turn the ship into that narrow harbor? And the captain replied, do you see those three red lights on the shore? He said, when they're all in a straight line, we follow it right into the safe, safety of the harbor. Well, this morning I've got six dots that we're going to connect to help us discover how to find God's will. The first one is to commit yourself to God. In Psalm 37, verses 1 through 5, David wrote, Do not worry because of evildoers, nor be envious toward wrongdoers, for they will wither quickly like the grass and fade like the green herb. Trust, and I'm, I'm reading this now out, out of the, uh, the Amplified Version, Trust, rely on and have confidence in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and feed securely on His faithfulness. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires and petitions of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him also, and he will do it. Now, as we read that, you maybe didn't see the five principles that David actually lays out for us on committing our lives to God. Let me give them to you. Principle number one is when your feelings mesmerize you, they may misadvise you. He said, don't worry and don't envy the sinner. He said, and he went on to say their prosperity is about like a single seed of grass on the prairie of eternity. He said, so don't worry about them and quit focusing on them. Instead, look to God and trust him. Principle number two, when the character of God is visualized, your resolve is vulcanized. He said, trust in the Lord and do good. Don't, don't get distracted by visualizing what the evil are doing, don't be envious of them. Instead of focus on God and trust in him and in his character and do good. Number three, when you abide in God, you're supplied by his faithfulness. He said, dwell in the land and feed securely on his faithfulness. Jesus said in John 15, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. When we abide in God, when we have an, a, an ongoing, a healthy relationship with God, he is going to supply our needs. The Bible says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and these things shall be added unto you. But my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus the Lord. So when we abide in God, he's going to uh, supply our faithfulness. Number four, when you celebrate the goodness of God, you can cultivate his blessings. David said, delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires and petitions of your heart. But it's when we are delighting in God, when we are celebrating his goodness, that, that we are purposely resetting the switch in our mind instead of seeking the pleasures of the world that are empty and hollow and, and uh, they, they are anything but lasting, they're temporary. 
Instead of seeking that, we reset and instead we choose to delight in God and to celebrate his goodness. And then number five, when you dedicate yourself to God, you activate his promises. David said, commit your way to the Lord, trust in him, and he will do it. When we are obedient to him, God is going to bless us. Now let me give you the second C. I know you were in hopes that those were all C's and we were almost done, but we're just ready for the second C now. Concentrate on the power and presence of God. Concentrate on the power and presence of God. Solomon said it this way, trust in the Lord with all your heart. He didn't say trust in your 401k. He didn't say trust in the latest social program. He didn't say trust in the talking heads on the news channels, but he said trust in the Lord and how are we to do that? With your whole heart and lean not on your own understanding. That, that phrase lean not means prop yourself up. And it'd be the idea of walking with a cane and somebody coming over and kicking it out from under you on your way into IHOP and you fall, you know. And uh, and, uh, so maybe that was, was Nancy using a cane the other night? Should have been, okay. But but it means to prop yourself up with your own understanding. That's not it. We're, We're concentrating on self when we do that, but we're supposed to concentrate on the power and the goodness of God Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not under your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. In Psalm 73, the psalmist said, You will guide me with your counsel and afterward receive me into glory. Third C, consider the power of scripture. Consider the power of scripture. I want you to get this. The will of God for the people of God is revealed in the word of God. I'm going to give it to you again. The will of God for the people of God is revealed in the will of God. If you want to know what God's will is for you, we need to read God's book. Paul wrote, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the child of God might be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. It's not like some magazine that you, that you go into the uh, Walgreens and buy off the, ca- off the counter and read it once and set it aside. Every time I read it, I find something new and something else that strengthens my faith. The will of God for the people of God is revealed in the word of God. Notice what Paul said to the church at Thessalonica in his first letter, chapter 2 and verse 13. And we thank God constantly for this. Now I want to call your attention to that word constantly because when you get over to chapter 5 and verse 17, uh, Paul is saying pray without ceasing. He's saying we need to pray constantly and we also need to be thanking God constantly. And we also thank God constantly for this, that when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, but it's what it really is, the word of God, which is at work in you. This is a book like no other book. It is the living, vibrant word of God. It cannot be improved upon. It should not be, uh, it should not be disrespected, but we need to apply it to our life each and every day of our life. And then Paul says it's at work in you. It is revealing God's word to us. It shows us the path we ought to take in life. In Psalm 119, 105, God's word is a lamp for our feet and a light that shines brightly on our path. It will guide us. Now, I'm told that the lamps at those times or the lights that they would use when they walked in darkness was a piece of iron that was kind of the shape of a musical note. You had the handle here and then you had the staff come down. And where the note is actually there on the bottom was actually a little pot. It would be like this plate. It would have a staff coming up and then it would be bent so you could hold upon it. And then it would have little slits all the way around. And they would have burning coals and embers in there. And when they walked, they would hold that out in front of their feet and it would shine on their path. And that's what the word of God is to do for us. 
It shows us the way that we are to take, and the better we know the Word of God, the more clearly we are going to know His will. That's why God told Joshua in chapter 1 and verse 8, This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Let me give you the fourth C now. Commit yourself to prayer. Jeremiah 33, 3 is a wonderful verse. <clears throat> and in that passage of Scripture, God is saying, Call to me, and I will answer you and will show you great and mighty things which thou knowest not. It's an invitation for us to go to him in prayer and say, God, show me what you mean by here. By this spot right here in Scripture. There's many times I don't really get it, and then I pray about it, and more of the truth is revealed to me. And there's times in my life where I say, God, I'm clueless. And it's kind of then I hear God speak, you're not telling me anything I didn't already know. <laughs> but, but I'm saying, God, what, what am I supposed to learn from this? There's got to be a message for me in this somewhere. And, and, uh, and it's not like I hear an audible voice, but it's like a passage of Scripture comes to me then, and then, uh, and then I get it. You know, God is, God is speaking to me at that time. So commit yourself to prayer. And then in Luke 11, verses 9 through 10, Jesus said, I tell you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and the one who knocks it will be opened. He is encouraging us to pray. Now I want you to get the language on this because the way this is, this is actually written in the Greek, it's the idea to keep on asking, to keep on seeking, to keep on knocking. It's something that speaks about persistence. It's not that we pray once and we're done with it. I've got people that I have prayed for for, for you know, 10 and 15 years. And I continue to pray for them and ask God to work in their lives. In 1 John 5, 14, we're talking about the sea of committing yourself to prayer. Jesus says, or excuse me, John says, this is the confidence we have before him that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Now, stay with me now. The one C was you know, we're supposed to be in the word of God because it reveals God's will for us. So the more that we are reading God's word, the more we are apt to be praying according to his will, and God is more likely to hear us and answer our prayers. C number five, consult with people of wisdom. Where there's no guidance, a people falls, <clears throat> but in an abundance of counselors, there is safety. Now the proverb, chapter 12, verse 15 a fool's way is right in his own eyes, but whoever listens to counsel is wise. Proverbs 15, 22. Plans fail when there is no counsel, but with many advisors they succeed. Over the years, I have had people that I've looked at, at my mentors, as my mentors. John Hayden was one. John was instrumental in, in the bringing me to salvation, you know, introducing me to Christ. So there were times over the years I would call John and I'd ask him questions. Raymond Barber was, was one of my mentors. He was one of my college professors, and I was fortunate to, to serve on his church staff for, for about three years. And over the years, I would call Dr. Barber, and I would ask him questions. And there was a couple of th times I said, you know, I don't think we ever covered this in, in Bible college. And, uh, and I'd say, uh, and so I'd ask him those questions, you know. And then there was another one, Bruce Parmenter. I would call Bruce, and I would talk to him. And, uh, and so, uh, because I realize there's, there's wisdom in the abundance of counselors. So, trusted Christian people, people of wisdom, that's one of the C's. Consult them. Talk it over with them. Ask them what they would do. Ask them to pray for you. And then C number six, contemplate the leading of the Holy Spirit. In John chapter 14, Jesus said, but the advocate, and the Greek word there would be paraclete, and it means one called alongside to help. One called alongside to help. And, and uh, so that's what the Holy Spirit does. And he advocates for us before the Father. We pray in Jesus' name. 
because Jesus, for there's one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. So we pray in Jesus' name, he intercedes for us, but the Holy Spirit speaks to our hearts and he advocates for us. He, he comes alongside of us to help us, but the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send to my name. Now, notice what he will do for us. This is why we need to contemplate the leading of the Holy Spirit. He will teach you all things. He will remind you of everything I've said to you. Peace I leave with you, my peace. Jesus says, I give you. I do not give you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. And then you go down in John 16, it tells us that the Holy Spirit uh, also guides us. Listen as I read it. Jesus said, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I'm going away, for if I do not go away, the advocate will not come to you, but if I go, I will send him to you, and when he comes, he will prove the world wrong concerning sin. When he, the Spirit, comes, he will guide you into all truth. The Holy Spirit will never, and I want you to get this, the Holy Spirit will never lead you to do something that is contrary to the Word of God. I don't know how many times that people say, I don't care what the Bible says, this is what I feel. Well, Judas felt something and he went out and hung himself. So, you know, that's not the way we ought to be doing it. You know, Demas felt a certain way and he, and he deserted Paul. And so feelings are not very trustworthy. If I just live by my feelings, you know, I would hang out in Baskin Robbins all day long, you know, instead, instead of something like that. You know, if ice cream and popcorn was health food, I'd be one of the healthiest people in the world. But, but it's not, so I can't go by my feelings. Those are, those are cravings, those are feelings that we can't trust. But we can trust the leading of the Holy Spirit. And he'll never lead us to do something that contradicts God's words. He will guide us into all truth. Number seven, we need to clarify it all with an eternal perspective. A couple of questions to ask. When I'm, when I'm wrestling with a situation... When I'm trying to determine what God's will, I say, I'll ask myself now, in the light of eternity, how important is this? Because sometimes we get worked up about a lot of things that, you know, in the light of eternity, it really doesn't matter a whole lot. The second one is, am I focusing more on the here and now than the there and then? And sometimes we are so focused on something that is happening right now in our lives that we are giving no thought to what the will of God is, what the Bible says about praying about it, or how it fits into the scheme of eternity. Is God speaking through my circumstances? What doors might he be opening and closing? You know, for, for the ones, you know, I know that these college students, you know, they, they want to get into a certain college, and sometimes they're heartbroken because they don't get accepted. No, God's, God just closed that door so you don't have to worry about it and go find which door's open. You know, when I was at the graduation I, uh, down at Texas A&M, the college president said 79,000 people apply to Texas A&M every year. 10,000 students are accepted. So that means God closed the door on 69,000. Why? Because he's got a better place for them that fits them. And that's the thing. Sometimes we think, well, I'm a failure. No, that's God closing the door, and he's got another one open. So we need to read the Bible. We need to seek him in prayer and see what he has for us. Let me read Philippians 1, verses 12 through 14. I want you to know, brother and sisters, now listen carefully to what it's saying. What has happened to me, and they are aware that Paul is in prison right now. This is what's called one of the prison epistles. It's something that Paul wrote while he was in prison. So he's saying, what has happened to me, the fact that I'm already in prison, has actually served to advance the gospel. Those are his circumstances. Now, was Paul really happy he was in prison? No. But Paul was happy that because of his circumstances, it was affecting eternity for other people. It has actually served to advance the gospel, and as a result, it's become clear. He says, I'm seeing God's will here. And not only am I seeing God's will here, but he says, throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. Now, I'm going to confess, I have never woken up any morning and said, God, 
please send me to prison today. I don't think that's a prayer I would pray. But, God, but Paul realized God was using those circumstance, circumstances for the furtherance of the gospel. And because of my change, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord. Notice what? And they dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. They were standing up, facing down Rome, and saying, we are not going to bow down to Caesar and, uh, and pray to him but we're going to lift up the name of Jesus Christ and we're going to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ even if we end up in chains like Paul. So what are the circumstances? In the light of eternity, this was pretty important. Were they focusing more on the here and now or the there and then? Paul was focusing more on the there and then and the believers in that area were becoming more confident and they were realizing that God was opening up a door of opportunity for them as well. In Romans 8, Paul wrote, For I consider that our present sufferings cannot be compared to the coming glory. And tying that into what was said in Philippians, Paul was saying my pres present imprisonment cannot be compared to the glory that is waiting on me in heaven. In his last letter that he wrote to Timothy, he said, For the time of my departure is at hand. I fought a good fight. I finished my course. Henceforth there is a crown of righteousness laid up for me, and not for me only, but unto all those who love the Lord Jesus Christ. I consider that our present sufferings cannot be compared to the coming glory that will be revealed to us. I'm convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor heavenly rulers, nor things that are present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in creation. And I'm going to throw this in. This isn't in the scripture. We'll be able to thwart the will of God. Paul said we'll be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. So what do we do? We've got these C's. How do we connect the dots? How do we apply it? Well, let me give you about four things to think about in the coming week. It's God's will for each and every one of us to learn more about him. In Colossians 1, 9 through 10, Paul said, For this reason we also, from the day we heard about you, have not ceased praying for you and asking God to fill you with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom. So God wants us to grow in his grace and in his knowledge. Secondly, it's his will that we grow in grace and abstain from sexual immorality. That's 1 Thessalonians 4.3. Thirdly, it is his will for us to be thankful. 1 Thessalonians 5 verses 6 through 18. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Now, I want, you, I want you to look at the language here. Give thanks. Now, notice the word, in. Didn't say for, but give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. There are some things that we're going to endure in our life that are anything but pleasant. But we can give thanks because we know Christ is right there with us. And then number four, it's his will that we share our faith. 1 Timothy 2, 1 through 5. Paul said, I urge then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. This is good, and it pleases God our Savior. See, it's his will. Who wants all people to be saved and come to knowledge of the truth. And I'm going to close with number five. It's God's will for us to live a consistent life. 1 Peter 2, 15. For this is the will of God that by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. That by living a consistent, good, and godly life, people will see we're serious about our faith. And they may not say it audibly, but they're going to think, they've got something that's missing in my life, and I want it too. I want to meet Jesus. Well, fathers, we come now in Jesus' name. I want to thank you, dear God, for our time together today. I pray, God, that you might help us that through your word, through the leading of your spirit, Father, to connect the dots that we might know your will for our life. And we'll thank you for it. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, we're going to conclude the services here today. And uh, we want to thank you for coming. And uh, connect the dots, okay? God bless you. Have a good week.